What's up guys, welcome back to Vanover Customs. Today's video, we're gonna be continuing on with scraping on the lathe, and we're gonna be focusing on this top slide slash apron area. Now we just finished up with the compound. So if you wanna watch that video, there's gonna be a link up here in the card. But long story short, this is gonna be a lot of work and it will be worth it. Uh, but there's a little bit more intricacies when we're scraping this in compared to the compound. And that's gonna make doing this video today a little bit more complicated and definitely lengthy. So if you're looking forward to that journey, stick around. Let me bring you in close and show you what we gotta do to get ready to get this guy scraped. We're over here at the carriage and let's talk for a minute about the strategy we're gonna use when we scrape this in. So initially what I really wanted to do was scrape this in place. Now obviously that's gonna make it more difficult to scrape, but the benefit to doing something like that is, is it saves a ton of time in disassembly from removing the bottom of the apron and trying to disassemble stuff, potentially having to remove lead screws, and you just add a lot of work when you're gonna try to fully disassemble everything. The other reason why it may have made some sense to do that is this lathe does not have a lot of wear in the bed, very, very minimal. So it is my anticipation or my thesis or hypothesis that the actual wear on the bottom of the carriage is pretty minimal, which also highlights the fact that if you didn't remove the carriage, getting away with scraping just the top portion may be passable. And although those things may be true, the more I thought about it, the more I realized we are going to disassemble this. And for one real main reason. So the main reason is ease of scraping. I just spent the last 40 or 50 hours scraping in that compound and scraping is a lot of work. And I think I could scrape this at an angle but the reality is the amount of time that I would save and the quality of my scrape job would dramatically go up if I was able to take this and position it at an angle so I could get the scraper in there. So whatever time we lose in disassembling that, we are going to gain in being more efficient with the scraping. That's the primary reason we're gonna disassemble this. The secondary reason is that when you're doing scraping on this part here, what you wanna do is you wanna scrape the flats first, the dovetail second for parallelism, and then once that's done, you'll wanna lay it on the lathe bed and do a print on the bottom of the carriage so that way if anything is out of alignment, you can adjust it on the bottom of the carriage. Now I'm not too concerned about that on this machine, but having it upside down is gonna let us get in there and inspect, number one. Number two, if there is anywhere, try to even it out. And number three, adjust any geometry that is maybe slightly off. And also be able to clean up under there and make sure everything is free of chips and dust. It's also gonna allow us the ability to get in here into the apron and just make sure the oil is clean and that there's no gunk down there because we have it apart. So with all that being said, let's jump right in and let's start to get this disassembled a little bit further. We're gonna come in here and remove this bracket. It's a bracket for the DRO. And I went ahead and turned down a boss here uh, earlier when I got the lathe. So that way when the tailstock comes up, it doesn't smash the DRO. We might actually change this because this lathe did have a tow along tailstock and in order to install the DRO, I had to eliminate that. I would like to retain that feature. So this is what's here right now, but we might be changing this design. While we have the carriage off, I would like to add a couple more holes just to add some options for the future. This is also the hole that the follow rest is supposed to attach to, and we covered that up as well. It'll also be easier to drill the holes on this piece out of the lathe, maybe on the milling machine or boring mill or something. And there you go. Actually, this is already machined and I added these holes for that bracket. So 
that's where the file arrest originally would have been fastened. All right, we're gonna remove these two. This is for the DRO mount. Uh, we might be getting a new DRO, so that may not be relevant. And this is the power cord for the automatic carriage feed. So it's just wiring, basically. A very interesting setup. I can't tell if it's factory. It looks a little strange to me. It was much longer. I ended up shortening this because it stuck out really far and I wanted to be able to get this closer to the wall. There you go. That's how you know I was in there. We had some nice Wago wire nuts. So I'm gonna take a photo of that and then we'll disassemble this. It's marked 11.30 seconds. Makes me believe that it is not factory because this lathe is Bulgarian, so it should be metric. That wire goes right into the apron, or the carriage rather. And this we need to slide all the way out. Next, we'll remove this DRO scale. Now we'll be able to get in here and remove this back plate. We're going to remove all these bolts on this side. Now I've taken a couple lathes apart and half of the lathes have the bottom catch attached from the bottom, which means you'd have to slide the whole thing off the end. The other ones have bolts in from the top. We do have some bolts here, um, so I don't know if this is going to allow us to pull this off once we get the bolts out or we're going to have to pry the bottom down, but either way, we'll see what we can do. Excellent news, I am fairly certain that this carriage lifts straight up. So there is a block that goes all the way underneath, but it looks like it was bolted from above, which is really convenient. If that's true, what that means is we can literally lift the carriage straight up, leaving the apron intact, meaning we don't need to remove any of the cross feed screws. And there's nothing wrong down here, there's nothing we gotta do, so we can leave this intact. I have a magnet lifter, so we're gonna go ahead and get this magnetized. It's good for 2,000 pounds, I believe. Uh, maybe a little bit more. And uh, we're gonna use the jib crane to kinda just lift up on this and just test our theory. Just looking under there, I think we're gonna be golden and that's gonna save us some time. Now there is a wire in there, we do need to be aware of that. All right, we've adjusted our lifting point to be more even. I think we're gonna be good. There we go. And we have an oil line over here. So we need to figure out how to get this more balanced. So I'm gonna sit this down on some blocks and then re-rig this and then we'll figure out where we're gonna go from there with that wire and that oil line. All right, we were able to get that wire cleared up and the oil line disconnected, so let's lift this baby up. Got a more even lift point. Just confirming, yep, wire's good, oil line is good. 
But we got a lot of lubrication under there, so I really love that. Touchdown. We went ahead and got this cleaned up. I just removed whatever paint was left on it and went through and got rid of all the junk out of the holes, got rid of all the chips, and got everything nice and set up here on the bench and ready to be scraped. Before we come in and start scraping this, what we're gonna do is take some measurements and see where we're at as far as where. I did some preliminary measurements on the machine and if my memory serves me correct, we have about a 3,000th dip here in the middle. Um, but let's bring you in closer and get some metrology out and get some measurements on where here. Just like we talked about in some of the previous videos, when it comes to scraping or doing any measuring of that matter on these pieces of equipment, a reference surface is extremely important so that you know what your measurements mean in comparison to that reference surface. Now here we have two reference surfaces that we can go off of and just kind of compare our measurements. So the first one is this ledge right along the edge here on this side. So this edge here, uh, nothing rides on this. And so we can compare the factory measurement here to the worn area here. <clears throat> and you can actually feel the gap or the dip when you traverse this. So we have a depth gauge here. So what we could do is we can take the depth gauge over here and mic the difference between these surfaces. The other thing that we can do, and a lot of times the better option, because you don't have this luxury, is this top surface here is not a wear surface. And usually it is machined at the same time that the base is machined. Now it's not 100% perfect, but it does give you a good indication as to where you are. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure both off of this and off of this and kind of compare. And then what we'll do is we'll get the straight edge over here, set the straight edge and we'll use a feeler gauge and try to confirm our measurements. And we'll repeat that process on both sides. So we're gonna start out by just kind of coming along this edge and I'll make some measurements and write them here on the edge. And then what we'll do is we'll step up here and we'll take some measurements and we'll write them all down that edge and then we'll repeat the process over there. So we'll start right at the beginning. And in order for this to work, we wanna make sure this surface is cleaned and stoned. All right, let's get started. So our first one is gonna be kinda of right here. Come down, ratchet, and right there it's saying three thousandths. I'm just gonna write three. Does not necessarily seem accurate, but we're just gonna go with it and go all the way to the end. I'm gonna repeat that measurement. Okay, come down here. And we're gonna repeat this process all the way down. I'll bring you back once we're done. All right, now that we got that side done, we're gonna come up here and off of the top, we will make the same measurement. All right, we got this side done. Now we're gonna use a gauge block to kind of average everything and come up here and do the same thing in the same location. Kind of go down the whole way and we'll just compare our measurements. All right, we got this all mapped out and overall I'm really impressed with how little wear there is. Initially when I took that 3,000th measurement uh, over here where I could feel the wear, I just assumed it would be three, four, or five thousandths off, which actually is pretty good. Uh, but when I measured the ends, I was also registering about three thousandths. So when you put it in perspective and map it out, really on this side, we only have a deviation of about a thousandths. Now I am just kind of rounding up or down, um, basically to a half thousandths for this initial shot here just to give us an idea of what we're working with, but this is really good. And on the other side, we have a 2000s deviation over here uh, at the high spot, and then our low is at the back here. So overall, I would say we're looking really good. We have a little bit more wear on this side, which makes sense because it's closer to the chuck, but it really isn't as bad as I thought. 
Um, so this kind of just gives us an idea of where we're starting. Now I do want to get a straight edge over here with the feeler gauge and see if we can confirm what we're seeing. Um, but so far, this looks really, really good. I do have a straight edge here. Now when I get it in there, the problem that we have is because this section is unworn, it's kind of resting on there. So I'm not able to get a feeler gauge in there. What I can do is I can bring this out and kind of stand it on in like this. However, the straight edge isn't very accurate in this manner because this pointed edge isn't really designed to be scraped. Uh, you're scraping either face, but we can still just kind of use it as a very rough test and see, are we able to get, you know, a 2000 shim in there, a 3000 shim and so forth. So here's a 3000 shim. All right, I'm not able to get that under there, which is good. Here's a one and a half thousand shim. I guess according to the measurements, we'd be about one thousandths off, but this straight edge and this orientation isn't really that accurate. It actually happens to be fairly straight and I can't get this under there. So that looks really, really good actually. So I'm gonna say that the measurements that we have on here are fairly accurate. So the next step is to come in here and we're just gonna set our scraper to the longest stroke and come in here and get a nice cross hatch pattern going on both sides and then we can take a print and see where we land. Here we go. I know I'm gonna have a ledge right here, um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make two more passes, one going back this way, one going back the way I just went, and then after that's done, I'll stone it and go ahead and get it blued. I just wanna create a little bit more separation and contact uh, before I do the first print. This is a prism straight edge that we got off eBay. And we're using our homemade bluing solution. All right, here's the very first print. So you can see, um, no surprise here, we're touching here on this high spot on the ridge and we're touching in the back where it's hard to scrape and that line that I told you about, yep, we're touching on that and again on the high spot here. So here's what I'm gonna do at this point. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna step scrape this factory edge, probably three or four passes. We'll come in here and we'll scrape the back edge and then we'll try to scrape out this ridge here. You can just barely feel it. And then once that's done, we'll come back and we will take another measurement. So we'll come in here and just mark the areas with the Sharpie that we're gonna step scrape. The actual part only contacts here where this line is, but I don't want it to be a high because when I lay on the straight edge, it's always gonna drag there and I'm not gonna get a reliable measurement. So that's why we're scraping this. All right, we're gonna do our second print here. I'm gonna guess we're still gonna be a little high here, but hopefully we get an improvement. 
All right, we're looking good. So we do have a little bit of a low here. Great, that means we made some good progress there. And our bluing reached a little farther this direction, which means we're working this way and we have more contact. We still have our strip here, but we're making a little better progress and we still have that spot there in the back. Hit heavy on, there's a line right here that's high. So we're gonna hit these pretty heavily and then we'll hit the other stuff a little lighter. I have found when I'm scraping that I do a better job in this orientation. So I'll scrape this way with a part 45 and then I'll flip it and come the other direction. Me trying to scrape left hand, it doesn't seem to work out very well. All right, and then we'll hit this little line. I might still be high there, just based on this line that I'm seeing, but we'll see in a minute. My hypothesis is we'll still be a little high there, but we'll see. Yeah, we're getting there, we are getting there. So we are still high here, we got a belly there. So I'll bring you back in five or six passes and show you where we're at. All right, about two hours has elapsed and this is where we're at. We do have coverage all the way across on pretty much all the surfaces. I know when we last touched off in the last shot, we were heavy on this and we were able to work that down. And we might be still a little heavy here, um, but we still have really good contact. Um, so this is looking really good. We've been using a really long stroke on the biax, so we're gonna shift over to using a shorter stroke. Okay guys, we're gonna stop here for the day. Uh, this isn't perfect, but it's really good and probably sufficient for what we're trying to do on this project. We do have a flat surface and we have a lot of points going on here. Uh, I would love a little bit more surface contact and I would love to come in here and break these dots up a little bit more. However, I don't wanna go too crazy until we get the other side done, until we check the geometry because we don't wanna make any detailed adjustments over here and then come back and have to change the geometry. We just be repeating work. The other thing I wanna do is come in and take a measurement from here down to the surface. We have the old ones written up there and I wanna see how much we've taken off. And the reason why that's critical is the nut in here is gonna be moved down this distance that we've removed plus the amount of material we've moved off the top slide when we get to that point. And with the sloppy nut, it probably doesn't make a difference, but we are gonna be doing a new lead screw and a new nut, and we need to shave off whatever the combination is between this and the top slide on the top of the nut, so that way when the top slide comes down, it's not pushing the nut down. We got the carriage flipped around, and now we're gonna start working on this side. So it looks like our base is over here at zero and our high is right here at two. Not bad for a first print. Looks like we're bearing here. And here, you can see we're touching here. We have decent contact here, uh, to be honest, and then a little bit there. All right, that's looking a lot better just off those quick adjustments. I think it may be hitting back here a little bit, um, but that's looking good. All right, here's our third print. We're still heavy in these similar areas, but we're migrating out. 
So I'm gonna work this off camera for another 10, 12 different steps and I'll bring you back once we're a little bit closer. So overall, this is looking real good. I did take some measurements off this surface and we are very, very close to uh, the same amount of metal removal on both sides. So these should be close to being parallel. Um, so the next step here is just get all this stuff cleaned off and we'll take some measurements of the actual V-ways um, and see how we're looking. Now that we went ahead and scraped both sides and we have a nice flat surface, we're gonna come in here and measure the dovetails and see what our parallelism is like. Now we do wanna make sure these surfaces are flat because if we have a big belly here in the middle, for example, and you go to measure with one of these blocks, it's gonna rest down um, and then it's gonna make a different measurement on the actual contact. So now that we know that these surfaces are flat in both directions, that means the distance between here and where this makes contact on the V-way is going to be consistent. And there are some undulations from the scraping, but these gauge pins kind of find the average. So I went ahead and stoned these surfaces, these surfaces, and acetoned everything. Um, so now we're gonna go down and measure and see what our parallelism is. So when you're measuring tenths on a micrometer, it can be a little tricky to get accurate measurements. I'm not saying this is the right way, but this is what I did to be a little bit more successful. Originally, I was going off the gauge pins, and they, that works fine, but you have to kind of work it to find the high spots. And what you're kind of looking for is the lowest dimension here, right? Because the lowest dimension is going to be the most accurate. Now, if you measure a little low here, and you're already looking for the lowest dimension when you're measuring, you can easily get a false reading. So you really have to be directly in the center when you take a measurement. Now, when you lay the micrometer on the ways here, the base lays on this side and it keeps this side about halfway up, which is really convenient. But on this side, you can kind of move up and down. So what I did is I just took two gauge blocks and I kind of stacked them over here on the side like this, and that gave me a more square face to register to. And then on this side, I added another gauge block so that way, when I make the measurement, even if I'm skewed slightly, it'll be consistent. And in this case, reference is more important than measurement. So every time I measure, I'm resting the micrometer on this base, and I'm resting this side on that gauge block, and I'm using the thumb wheel to get the exact amount of pressure. And then while I measure, I kind of wiggle this until I get it and it stops wiggling that's when I know that I'm tight. At the bottom here, we're at 65 and a half or 5 tenths, 66 and 5 tenths, then we jump to 67 and 5 tenths, 67, 9 tenths, 67, 9 tenths, 67, 9 tenths, 68, 67, 9, 67, 2, 65 and a half, and 65, 8. So overall, we have a deviation of 2.5 thousandths which is very close to what I was kind of guessing. And that what you gotta keep in mind is that's divided by two sides, right? So if we have 2.5 thousandths of a belly, which is what we have, it's lower here in the center, right? So it's a belly. It's probably bellied on both sides. Now it doesn't necessarily mean it's even. It could be two thousandths on this side and half a thou on this side, but it is divided between two. So 2.5 realistically isn't probably half, but maybe it's 30%, 60%. That's really not that much on one side, maybe thousands, thousands and a half. We got our part set up and we're ready to start scraping. Before we jump in, let's talk about the strategy we're gonna be using. It's one thing when you're scraping flats, it's another thing entirely when you're trying to do geometry changes, adjust perpendicularity and parallelism, that's a bit more complicated. So there's three things we're doing when we're scraping this. The first and the easiest is scraping for flatness. 
That'll be done with the straight edge. It's pretty straightforward. The second and a little bit more challenging is scraping for parallelism. The best way to do that is to scrape and to measure off both sides. Not really that difficult, but in this position, it's going to be quite a bit more difficult. And the third thing is scraping for perpendicularity, perpendicularness to the actual center axis of the lathe. Now, in the best case scenario, when we scrape this, we'd make sure it's parallel, perpendicular, and flat. And we can do that within reason, but we do have to do a lot of back and forth and double checking and tweaking to get to that point. So let's work off of what we know. We'll start there and then we'll make modifications from that point. So here's what we know. When we measured for parallelism, we know that the relationship between this section is different from this section and this section. Now, according to our measurements, we have a high spot here but we don't know if that's on this side or this side or a combination of both. The other thing that we know is when we look at this and you can't see this on camera, but we have an area that looks like it has very little wear in this region because I can see some factory scraping there still. Very minute, but you know maybe one, two tenths. So when we combine those two things that we know with our measurements and what we see, we know that at a minimum this area is a lot different than this area. And a lot is an exaggeration, but it's different enough that we should be concerned with. And when we know how machines wear, we know that this area is most likely less worn than the center because of the usage of how the top slide slides and also based on what we see visually. So in my opinion, the best way to tackle this is to come up here and step scrape this unworn area down to a similar plane as this worn area and then from there use the straight edge to try to dial it in. All right, so we'll maybe take three, four passes here and then once that's done, we'll go ahead and do a cross hatch both ways and then get the straight edge up there. Now, once we get the straight edge that allow us to get this flat, and then we can adjust our parallelism off this flat surface on the back side here. Now, when regarding our perpendicularity, we may be able to make fine tune adjustments here as well, but I'm hoping that we can dial any perpendicularity adjustment off the bottom. Depending on how bad the lathe is worn is going to depend on how much out it is in terms of perpendicularity, and that's the most difficult one to address. Honestly, on this lathe, I don't think it's going to be that bad, and it probably could be ignored. However, we're going to kind of set that aside right now and just focus on flatness and parallelism, and we'll start with this side. We're using our modified scraper blade here so we can get in here. Looks like we are maybe a little low over here, which is good. We started over there, so we'll ignore that. That means we brought that level down. So we'll just continue scraping. We'll focus scraping here and maybe a little bit here, and then we'll just keep repeating the process. Well, after about three and a half hours, this is where we ended up, and I'm really happy with this. As I've been scraping this machine, I've been trying to get as much advice and information as I can to ensure that we have a good product. And the best resource for information is that Conley book on machine tool rebuilding. So I opened up to page 265 and found uh, basically a diagram and it talks about the order in which you should scrape. And it refers to this way here as the swivel way and then the way on the back side where the gib is as the guide way. And according to the book, it recommends scraping the swivel way first, the flat ways second, the guide way third, and then fitting the gib and scraping that in fourth. Now that is not the technique that I used in this case. It suggests starting with this way first because it probably has the least amount of wear. 
Now, I've been following the method that Keith Rucker was using, where he was scraping the flats first, and there is a benefit there, and that benefit is, is that we're able to take measurements across uh, a little bit more accurately, which is what we did. Uh, but in this case, I think we're okay. Uh, the good news is, is this way here, the swivel way, actually had a very small amount of wear, as the book would suggest. And so I got pretty decent contact on the first couple of prints, uh, and I was quite surprised. I probably could have been done maybe 30 minutes in and it would have been fine. Uh, but I've been working just to try to up the points of contact, and I might hit this a couple more times. But overall, this is really good, um, and I'm really happy with it. It does dive down here on the corner, and this corner, but I'm not too concerned about it. Uh, they're not high spots, they're lows, which is good. We're gonna use this as our reference edge. We're gonna get this beast flipped around, and before we position it, I'm gonna take a measurement off of the other side and see if we've adjusted our parallelism any, and also record the amount of material we've taken off here. And that's gonna be important when we go to fit the nut, uh, because with a tighter nut, you have to keep aware of what kind of material you're removing and or take measurements because if you remove a bunch of material here and here, when you go to fit a brand new nut, it's gonna bind because the orientation has moved. We got our part set up at an angle and we're getting ready to scrape this in. Now, the more I think about this, the more I just can't wrap my brain around how we have a high spot here. Um, conventional wisdom would say that we would have a dip uh, because that's typically how stuff wears. Usually on the edge, you have less wear because there's less movement there. So let me know down in the comments what you guys think is causing that or if I'm crazy. And ultimately we'll find out here in a minute. I went back to the Conley book, tried to review that data, try to see if there was anything else that I'm missing, double check the measurements and everything is indicating that we have two to two and a half thousands high right here. So instead of overly thinking about it, we're just gonna scrape that area, step scrape it, take some measurements, confirm that we are making an improvement, and if we are, we'll just continue until we get the deviation down and then go on from there. So I've been working on the center and I've probably made 20 passes just from here to here. And I would make about seven or eight passes, check it, make seven or eight passes, check it, because I kind of wasn't believing what I was seeing. So I wanted to do a little bit of scraping, check it. And as we were going, we were making progress, but I found that doing one or two passes at a time just wasn't enough to register. So once I started doing five, seven, uh, we we're starting to get some metal moved. And so here's where we're at right now. So our lowest on the board is 61.9 and our highest is 62.5. That's six tenths of a difference. So we started out with 2.5 thousandths of deviation or two thousandths and five tenths. And we're down to six tenths. Um, and these are in half thousandths. So we're starting a little over zero, maybe zero heavy. All right, we're gonna go here. And it looks like we're about too low, which would be a thousandths. All right, so we are minus two, so minus a thousandths. We are minus half a thousandths, plus maybe two tenths, minus five tenths, minus five tenths, minus 1.5 thousandths, zero, minus 0.5 thousandths. Now again, we have a little pointer and we're going over a bunch of flake marks, so we gotta take this with a grain of salt, but when I was doing this earlier, I was having four or five thousandths of a sweep on the gauge, and we have a spot where we're at zero, a spot where we're at zero and our biggest deviation is like one and a half thousandths. So even on this, it is confirming that we've taken our four on this and bringing it down to one and a half at the worst, but fairly consistently about a half a thousandths. So we're looking really good. 
What I am gonna do is get it back on the bench and I am going to step scrape this section uh, two or three more times. I did some sort of a calculation really basically and figured out about how much I'm taking off per pass. Um, and it seemed to be about two tenths. So I wanna lower this section about four tenths. So we're gonna take two passes. And then once that's done, uh, we probably have a little bit of a low in here and that's okay. Uh, that'll be really easy to see with the straight edge. And then we'll come and we'll start scraping it like normal. All right, we got our very first print here on this side. We went ahead and hit that center like we talked about. So we should be fairly parallel. So now we're just trying to get it straight. We brought the middle down a little bit too much and we're touching on the ends, but that's perfectly fine. And in fact, uh, it's really easy to take these down and that'll ensure that we get a nice flat surface. So we'll just work these ends. We'll step scrape this and we'll do another print. Here's our second print after step scraping those ends. I'm not expecting to have full contact all over, but I am expecting to move that blue towards the center. All right, um, I'm gonna step scrape this, step scrape this. I'll probably do two passes. Well guys, we're back over here on the floor and that's not necessarily the funnest thing. So originally on the last clip I was showing you that I was step scraping both of these ends so that I could get down and get a nice flat surface. And as I was doing this other side, the swivel side, I just would scrape this down until registered flat. And then once it's flat, I would uh, scrape for contact just like we did on all the other flat surfaces. However, because these dovetails need to be parallel, uh, what I've decided to do is do four or five passes, bring it to the floor where it's easier to measure and then make my measurements. So that way I'm not creating a wedge or a taper and I can double check my work. But the problem that I'm running into is according to my blue up and my straight edge, we're high here and here. And according to my measurements, we're high in the center. And if you remember right, we started high in the center about two and a half thousandths. And now my reading is anywhere between seven tenths and one and a half thousandths high here. Um, so if I scrape based on the measurements, I'm gonna be putting even more of a valley in the center here according to the straight edge, and I don't wanna do that. But if I scrape according to the straight edge, I'm gonna work the ends down quite a bit, and I might have a low here and here. And after a lot of deliberation and going back and forth, what I decided to do is just go back to the basics, right? So I wanted to double check this side, because if I made a mistake scraping this side, that's going to affect the measurement. So I re-blued this side with the straight edge and it came back straight and good. So that was great. I went ahead and redid both flats. And although they're not perfect, you know, and I do have a little bit of a hollow right here, they're close. They're not where they need to be in terms of contact points, but in terms of flatness and coverage, they look pretty decent. So that's not the issue there. And so I really don't wanna remove more material than I have to. And I feel like I'm in the area where I might be chasing my tail. And so the best thing to do um, is to go ahead and just set this aside and move on to the next part. And what that's going to do is that's gonna give us more information. So at the end of the day, whatever this ends up being doesn't matter. What matters the most is how well it fits with the top slide. We got the top slide over here on the surface plate. I just got it sitting on a piece of rubber. And overall, it doesn't look too bad. There's no major scoring. However, we can tell that this piece is worn. Uh, there's a little bit of factory flaking here and maybe here, but it is completely con and consistently worn down past the flaking. So we're gonna come in here and just do a checkerboard pattern. So that way when we do our first print, we don't get a smear and then we'll uh, flip it over and see what we look like as far as flatness. All right, here's our first print. It's looking real good actually. Uh, we have dotted contact here and here, and we're heavier here and here. Now my print is a little on the heavier side, number one and number two, 
the weight of this is going to make it a little bit more skewed, but we can get the main idea. And the main idea is, is that we're high on all four corners. So we're going to come in here and scrape all four corners just a little bit more, nothing too crazy. And then we'll get it flipped over and we'll do a second print. The other thing I want to know, and I'm just kind of curious of, is when we get it flipped over, I want to come in here with the height gauge on all four corners and see where we're at in terms of the parallelism from the top across this whole, this whole piece. So we'll get it flipped over and uh, we'll just check that once we get it scraped. After making our second pass scraping, I wanted to go around and just check before we get too deep to make sure we're parallel. And here's what we found. Using the height gauge and setting it off a zero over here, we have a plus three thousandths, plus five thousandths, and plus four thousandths, with this being a zero. So that's quite a bit to scrape out. It is possible, but it would take a little bit. So we went around and just double checked it with the micrometer. We turned this up on edge and miked each of these corners and they came back exactly the same. So we can trust both of these measurements and we know that this is the least amount of wear and this is the most amount of wear. Now this makes a lot of sense because we have a really heavy compound sitting here and this is the area closest to the chuck. So that kind of lines up with what we're seeing. Now instead of sitting here and trying to scrape this in, which we could do, I'm actually gonna set this up on the milling machine and use it as a surface grinder so that way we can get the surface ground. Now it's not gonna be nowhere near as accurate as a normal surface grinder, but it should hopefully get us within a thousands or so, and then scraping will be a little bit easier. We got the part set up in the KNT mill. I have it on three points to make sure it's not warping the part too much and get it nice and dialed in. I just wanna show you how close we got it here on the dial indicator. So we're right around zero on that indicator. And I'm gonna just gonna traverse the table all the way to the end. We do have a slight dip in the middle. Looks like maybe a thousandths. And then we come right back to zero here on the end. I tested it the other way and dialed it in that way as well and we're zero, zero. So overall, I think this machine is fairly accurate, but I know with the wear and the table and everything, it's not gonna be perfect. But hopefully we can take that four or five thousandths difference and bring it down to a thousandths. All right, this is looking good. We're touching down here. It's a little lighter over here. That makes a lot of sense because down here was more worn. So that looks really good. We're gonna go over to the other side and repeat the process and we'll keep working until we get consistent measurements with the mic across. Well, I'm really happy with how this turned out. I mic'd it in four spots on the front and back, and we're getting 37 thousandths everywhere except for the back edge. Over here, we're getting 36, and that means that on our opposing corners, we have a one thousandths deviation, which is about a fifth of where we started before. That is gonna be very nice when we go to scrape this. This is our first print. Everything's looking pretty good. We got some high spots here and here and over in this corner. We'll go ahead and get this scraped off camera and I'll bring you back once we get closer in. All right, here's a shot of our print after we hinged it. Overall, we're looking good. We still do have a low spot over here and over here and I would love to get to the edge of the corners over here and maybe over here. But overall, we're in a really good position. We do have contact all the way down on both sides. We've done multiple passes with the scraper and we're looking really, really good. I just wanna show you the hinging. I've measured a third from each side and I wanna show you how we're looking. So we are right on that third right there, you know, plus or minus a half inch. And on this side, you can see we're maybe right there, maybe a half inch, three quarters of an inch off. All right guys, we're done scraping. And overall, I'm really happy with where we're at. The next step is to get the swivel side of this dovetail scraped in. 
And before we do that, it would be really nice to know if this dovetail is running parallel to the actual body of the top slide. And unfortunately, it's a little hard to do that accurately because the best way to do it would be to put two gauge pins in here and measure off the back. However, on a lot of these machines, the back where the gib is, is angled, so that's not gonna work. Now what we can do and what we did do is we measured off of the front. And that side is machined, so it should be a relatively accurate test. You just gotta be careful when you're taking measurements off of a surface like this. So luckily we already did that off camera. We went down with a gauge pin and we measured using a micrometer and very surprisingly and luckily, this measurement, I took a measurement in three spots here in the middle and down here, the measurement was identical. And I'm talking identical within a tenth, which is very surprising, um, but very good. So what that tells me is at a minimum, we know that rough measurements are exactly the same, which means we can probably believe those measurements. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna get this edge scraped first, uh, a cross hatch pattern, then we're gonna get the straight edge over here and do our first print and see where we're at. We are ready to start scraping this bottom side. Half of the work of setting this stuff up is just the setup. So we have a pretty elaborate setup here. I have this sitting down in the T-slot on the table and leaned forward at an angle with a ratchet strap and then I have a secondary strap just kind of holding that in case the hook unhooks because uh, we don't want to drop this. I also have two lights clamped on both sides so that way we can light this area up and we can see what we're doing. So this isn't fully horizontal. If you lean it forward too far, this gets in the way of your hand with the biax, um, but this is gonna give us the clearance we need to get in there and uh, scrape that easily and see what we're doing. All right, not too bad actually. Um, so I know it's hard to see on footage, so I'll just point it out. We have contact here, here, actually the whole way down, but we have contact in the valleys and on the tips, which means that my scraping, which focused mostly on the middle, created a low spot, So and we have contact here, here, and here. So what that tells me is we're actually not that far off because just two passes of scraping created a divot and we were light on the edges, which is hard to get to. So we'll come back here and we'll scrape the edges. I'm, I'm probably gonna do this by hand, to be honest. All right, we're coming in here with our second print. All right, we're looking good. So still on the edge in the front and back, on the edge here, on the edge, on the edge. Really, we're missing contact here and here and in the middle. Um, other than that, we have contact all the way across. Well, after about six passes, we're looking really, really good. Uh, this probably is one of the least amount of wear on one of the ways that was on this machine. It's really not taken a lot of material to get down to this point. I've been doing a combination of hand scraping and machine scraping, holding the scraper upside down to really get in there. Um, we're gonna keep working this to try to get a little bit more contact and just try to knock down some of the highs, but overall, I'm really happy with how this is turning out. We're looking really, really good. We have really nice contact all along here. We probably have a little bit more contact on the ends, uh, but just slightly. And we have some nice size uh, contact patches. So overall, I'm really happy with this. 
before we go too crazy, because I don't really have a lot of time invested in here, maybe three hours, maybe four. Um, so I'm happy to put another hour just dialing it in a little bit more. I want to get it over to the carriage and test fit it. Um, because there's no point to go hog wild and then we get over there and we figure out that we're touching at the bottom only. All right, we got the top slide blued up and I'm getting tired of carrying this thing. So we got it on the crane with the magnet. So we're gonna do a back and forth. We're checking two things. We're checking the flats and then we're checking this dovetail on this side. So we have contact all the way down. And on this side, now keep, bear in mind that this area right here, pretty much no contact on the outside. Um, but we do have some contact here from the edge and we have a giant dip in the middle here. Um, and the contact we have on this side is pretty consistent but it's all the way down. So what we need to do on this side is come in here and just hit the high spots on this side, hit the high spots here. This is a smear, we have to ignore that. Couple spots there. Overall, not bad in terms of coverage. On this side, pretty consistent. We have consistent all the way down, uh, but similar kind of story. We only have contact about, you know, half an inch and then the last half inch, there's nothing. So that tells us what we need to do in terms of the planes. And then on this dovetail, we have contact on basically the first half, and then the top half has no contact. Coming in here on this side, just hitting the highs. I know this is gonna be hard to see on camera. It's hard for me to see in person standing right above it. Luckily, we're just fine tuning at this point. The other side, we might need to change the ge geometry slightly, but in this case, we're just fine tuning. A Little bit of an update. So we're making some good progress now, but we made some mistakes and I wanna share those with you and how we corrected them. So one thing that's really important when you're scraping is to double check and to not only double check, but double check with multiple methods of verification. Um, now I knew when I scraped both of these in that I didn't want to final fit them or chase the points too much because I was going to need to adjust it when I fit the top slide, and I knew that. But what I failed to do is, although that I made sure both of these planes were flat, I failed to do a somewhat rough check on the the level or the plane in which they're in. And the main reason is because setting this up on the surface plate is the best way to do this. Um, to make sure that you can dial it in and use a height gauge and check everywhere, that's the absolute best way. Uh, but because of the way the bottom is on this, it's really difficult to get a good reference. Um, it is possible, you know, you can put machinist jacks under there and you can zero all four corners, but if one corner is worn uh, down a little bit, it's gonna kinda throw you off. So I failed to check that canting of the surfaces. And when I came over here with the top slide, we were rubbing on this side over here. And I didn't think it was much, but off camera after you know scraping the highs a couple times, I realized it was off quite a bit. And so, when I put this on here and did a test rub for the first time, I was getting very minimal contact. I actually realized I could take a 4,000 shim and get it under, not everywhere, but certain spots. So what happened, and this is common, is the inside here is harder to scrape. And so I did scrape that, but I scraped this side more. And so what I did was I scraped it flat, but it was canted over, I don't know what the percentage or the angle would be, such that we had contact on the inside where it's harder to get to, and we were able to have 4,000 scap there. And as a result, the printing on this side was affected. 
So what I had to do is I had to kind of start over on this side, not entirely, but I had to go back to roughing and I roughed, step scraped just that first half inch and then I started to scrape the middle and we're getting to the point where now I'm getting contact, it's probably hard to see, at least in this area all across, back here just in the middle. Um, and I know that the back I over scraped a little bit because it's you know, hard to get in there. So it's a little easier to kind of bring the front down than it is to bring the back down um, and the back being inside the dovetail. So we're gonna keep fitting it and we're gonna get it where we need to be because we want, you know, you don't go through all this work to not have decent contact or at least parallelism. So we're gonna keep working it. What I realized that I could do, which is really obvious and easy, is I could have set an indicator base on here and I know this, you know, it is machined and it should be machined concentric to here, but it's not perfect. But with sitting an indicator base on here and having the indicator over here, I can go along this base and sweep this and see how parallel this plane is to this plane. And this plane is actually fairly parallel. This one I could clearly see in certain spots I was getting one, two, three thousandths roll off. Um, so I could have easily done just a rough check and that would have saved me from having to do a bunch of rework over here. But hey, it is what it is. It's part of the process. Six hours later, we're back and I'm happy with the results. We got some bigger spots. We got more breakup um, and ultimately it got us to a really good place. And can we take it farther? Absolutely. Um, but I don't think it's gonna yield for what I'm trying to do much more benefit than we have here. So let me just talk about what we got. So first off, we have really good coverage along the whole distance on both sides. Uh, for a minute there, I was trying to chase down. There's a line in here, very subtle, would have been completely acceptable. I was trying to chase it down and then I realized there's a line that runs the whole length on the bottom for oil. So it's not touching, not because it's a low, but because it doesn't contact when you slide that on here. So that's good. Um, this side looks dang near perfect. Obviously this strip here doesn't even contact and this strip in the back only contacts with the gib and I was able to get a straight edge on here and make sure that that back part is looking good and it is. Um, but for the most part, this strip is where it contacts and it looks really, really good. On the other side, we're looking really good as well. Uh, the last couple passes, I was actually a little darker here and a little lighter here. And the fact that we're a little heavier here has more to do with my heaviness on the ink. Um, however, we're looking really good. We have good coverage right into the dovetail. Um, I'm really, really happy with it. Uh, I spent way too much time on this in terms of what I thought, uh, but I am hoping that it is time well spent because this machine is gonna be doing a lot of good work for us, number one, and number two, these wear surfaces on the flats are gonna take the most amount of abuse, number one, and number two, uh, are gonna have the biggest impact on the feel of using the machine, and that being how the top slide feels to move and its tightness um, and how it does in deep boring in terms of the overhang of a boring bar is gonna be based on how tight the gib is and how well this fits. So I really wanted to spend extra time dialing it uh, as much as I could. Now that we've corrected the geometry, we are touching bottom and top all the way down to about this point. And then it switches to the middle bottom um, for the rest of the way, and it, it's close. It's really close. Obviously, we've had a straight edge on here and a straight edge on there, so they're both flat. Um, I don't know, I would go as far as say that the geometry is off here. If it is, it's slight. Um, you know, one to two passes of scraping probably is gonna get us where we need to go, but getting that corrected would be the next step, and then after that, we're on to fitting the gib.
Well, that was unexpected. I don't know what I was expecting, but I assumed with the minimal wear we started with the lathe that the gib would just slide in nice and we'd have plenty of meat. But what I didn't take into account for is how much material we've removed mostly off the flats of the carriage in addition to the meat we removed both on the flats and the V-ways of the carriage and top slide. And as a result, our gib is now not thick enough. So we're gonna pause the video here um, and I need to order some Turkite so that we can shim up the gib and get it in there and make sure it's fitting properly and get it scraped in. I hope you guys have been enjoying the process. I know these scraping videos aren't the most interesting, but believe me, however not interesting they are, they're about 10 to 20 times less interesting doing this. It's very tedious, um, but I think we are drawing close to the end of the scraping on the lion lathe. We do have to scrape in the gib and address the bottoms, uh, but other than that, we should be pretty squared away. So we'll bring you back in the next video to fit the tapered gib and uh, get the turkite glued on there and see where we're at with that. So until next time, have a good one. We'll see you in the next video.